I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag led by Shelby Lewis and Kyle Lewis of Milford Mill Academy and Jeliah Jefferson of Southwest Academy. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Good job. Dr. Dance, are there any additions or changes to, the, to tonight's agenda? Uh, there are none. Uh, is there a motion to adopt the agenda as prepared? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we'll proceed with the agenda as presented. Uh, Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak in this, at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed <coughs> sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in the box uh, to my right, and the first 10 will be drawn from the box, to be drawn from the box will be our speakers. Ms. Brett. Jasmine Shriver. <laughs> Stephanie Ebajuama. Uh, Jalea Jefferson, Four. Satya Long, Five. Lauren Murad, Lauren Brown, Kimberly Michelle, Michelle Natalie, Chris Zach. Marion Moore. <clears throat> Next on our agenda uh, is the superintendent's report. Dr. Dance. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Uh, a couple of announcements this evening. First of all, I want to welcome everyone back uh, from spring break. I hope everyone took an opportunity over the last six working days to rejuvenate, rest, relax, um, and enjoy the holiday season. Um, this is the time of year, of course, when we kick off the last quarter of the school year where we actually uh, finished strong because we started strong. But I want to say a, a few things, of course, giving our system the recognition it deserved because we learned that on April the 4th, we actually became one of 12 school systems that was given the Trusted Learning Environment Award. And that's seal given by COSIN, which is the Consortium for School Networking. And this seal actually is a distinction that's given to a very few select school systems because they demonstrate a very strong commitment to student data privacy and security by meeting a rigorous set of standards. And we are the only system in Maryland to receive this award. So I would like to just congratulate our team for that, especially our IT department led by Lloyd Brown, Innovative Learning led by Ryan and Brialli, and Business Services led by Kevin Smith, and Academics led by Rolita White. So congratulations. Can we give ourselves a round of applause for that award? This is also the time of year we start to recognize our principal and our teachers of the year. So next week, uh, we will have an opportunity to celebrate our 2016 or 17, 18, I should say, teacher and principal of the year. We have four outstanding finalists for the teacher of the year, which ranges from Owings Mills Elementary School to Pikesville High School, Mays Chapel Elementary, and Perry Hall High School. From Owings Mills Elementary is Rebecca Ng, who's in teacher's second grade. From Pikesville High School, we have the School to Career Transition Program Coordinator, David Kreller. From Mays Chapel Elementary School, we have grade three teacher Megan Stewart. And from Perry Hall High School, advanced placement in language teacher Shannon Stratzer. And then we have a last one um, for English and Career and Technology Education from Eastern Tech High School, Rebecca Talbot. For our principals of the year, and we did this about, I want to say three years ago, we started to separate elementary and secondary uh, principals of the year. We have three elementary principal finalists, Tracy Robinson from Glendon, Cheryl Brooks from Berkshire, and Melissa DiDonato from Padonia International Elementary School. So excited for our elementary principal finalists. But then for the secondary level, we have Aubrey Brown from Randallstown High School, Curia Joseph from Milford Mill Academy, and we saw some Milford Mill Academy students here uh, this evening. 
and Michael Weglin from Solis Point Technical High School. So next week we will be celebrating our finalists and doing the Academy Awards um, for our school system. Um, a lot of students have asked us when the last day of school uh, will be, so we've done the calculation. The last day of school will now be June the 13th as opposed to June the 19th. So I know that made some of our students happy and they're clapping. We can give them a round of applause too. <laughs> that. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, and we always have to, to wait as, uh, as well as us and other school systems, because our high school hours have to be 90 additional hours in elementary and middle school. But we have done the final calculation and verified that we can now close school on June the 13th. Um, there is a perception uh, that we don't have a facilities plan in Baltimore County, so I want to talk very briefly uh, around that work. We do have a 10-year facilities plan that's called Schools for Our Future. The board was presented in August, of, or I should say December of 2014, a comprehensive facilities assessment, which is posted on our website, which really looked at every single school within our school system. We used this data, which was quantitative and qualitative data, to actually work with our funding partners to come up with the Schools for Our Future program, which we're under now. Understand that the $1.3 billion investment we have in Schools for Our future is the most aggressive campaign that we've done around school construction here in Baltimore County. I do want to also say a special thank you to one board member who will be leaving us tonight who has become a very good dear friend uh, to me and that's Ms. Romaine Williams. Um, Romaine has been phenomenal um, in her role as a board member as chair of PRC. Uh, we had a very good lunch just on yesterday and I know that our friendship will continue but Romaine I really appreciate you um, and what you've done to move this system forward. Congratulations as you move to the next journey of your life. Last but not least, I don't think it's any secret um, that I share it with the board chair um, and the board vice chair today that I will be stepping down from my position June 30th of this year. Um, and personally, it was the right time for me and my family. And I know it's the personally the right time for the school system as well. Um, and while the superintendency has been the best job I could ever have had, um, it does weigh on you and becomes taxing. Um, and 18 hour days, they're just not sustainable. Um, but I am encouraged because of the hard work of our teachers, the hard work and the leadership of our principals. But I'm really, really encouraged because this community has rallied around education. And I'm really, really so proud of our students. And so I said it earlier today uh, to a group of students I saw, but I want to thank <coughs> and commend all 112,000 students who we put a lot on them. They've risen to the occasion. Our teachers, we put a lot on you. You've risen to the occasion. And our principals, you lead with your heart. And we have a wonderful group of support staff on the operations and the academic team that will keep Team BCPS going forward. Abby, congratulations on your reelection as TAP co president. And I know the best days of this system are ahead. And I will continue, as I said in my statement, to be the biggest cheerleader. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Now it's time for the chair's report, and uh, it would be appropriate uh, for me on behalf of the board to thank Dr. Dance for his service. Um, you have been a, uh, a champion of Baltimore County Public Schools, and we will indeed miss you. Um, but even with all of today's news, uh, the board's work goes on. All of us uh, on the board uh, hope that the spring break was rejuvenating for teachers, uh, for students, and for staff. Uh, we are now set to enjoy the great weather and the uh, closing eight weeks of uh, this 2016-2017 school year. Uh, graduation ceremonies, uh, believe it or not, commence in just six weeks. Um, a few weeks ago, um, just prior to spring break, I and many of my board colleagues attended a conference sponsored by the National School Boards Association. Uh, we were able to share BCPS's great successes and to learn of other districts with successes and those not quite as fortunate as, uh, as we are. I was struck by one quote used to promote one of the seminars that uh, I attended, and the quote can serve as a reminder uh, to all of us as we participate in charting uh, BCPS's future. Uh, John Dewey is credited with saying, if we teach today's students as we taught yesterday's, we rob them of tomorrow. I conclude my comments uh, to echo uh, Dr. Dance's. First of all, I know I, and particularly my colleagues on the Digital Safety Committee, Mrs. Miller and Mrs. Henn, uh, congratulate the Baltimore County School System on the uh, um, uh, Trusted Learning Environment Seal, uh, reflecting uh, the strong commitment to student data privacy and security. And I also want to 
um, celebrate the um, April 6 BCPS Film Expo, which was held at the Senator <coughs> Theater. Um, it showcased the talents of both middle school and high school students, and I thank the foundation for its work in supporting that expo. And all of you who uh, are able to place it on your calendar next year, you really should, because it's a spectacular event. Uh, Mr. Virch and I attended, and Mr. Virch was decked out as a theater person with his tuxedo and all. So it was a special, it was, it was a great night. Um, that concludes my remarks, and I invite Ms. Bratt to give her remarks. Thanks, Ed. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so as we all know, we are at the start of our fourth quarter and rapidly approaching the end of our school year. Now, certainly the season um, for the school year to grow a little bit hectic for students amidst AP exams starting the first two weeks of May, finals, and for my fellow seniors, college decisions. Um, so I wish everyone luck. I'd also like to update everyone on the work of the Baltimore County Student Council. The last three days before break, uh, Baltimore County took a delegation of more than 60 students to participate in the Maryland Association of Student Council Convention in Ocean City. Unfortunately, we did not spend the time um, lounging on the beach, but we did get the opportunity to meet students from around the state and, and participate in workshops that develop student leadership and teamwork skill sets. We also elected our officer team for the next school year for the Maryland Association of Student Councils, and all around, it was an amazing uh, learning experience for all delegates. I also have a few announcements. So the Baltimore County Student Council is hosting a Finish Sarcoma 5K on April 27th at Meadowbrook. Uh, Meadowbrook, Meadowood, I'll check that. Meadowood. And Meadowood, okay. <laughs> I thought that sounded wrong. Um, and everyone's welcome. We have a sign up online on the Baltimore County website. Um, this Friday will also be our final General Assembly um, for the Baltimore County Student Council. And we will be electing our officers for next year. Um, and we also have a guest in the audience. Um, Josie Schaefer um, is currently a junior at Pikesville High School. She interns for Delegate Shelley Hedelman and is a founding mem member for her BBYO uh, Jewish Youth Chapter. Um, and she is also the student pick for the next board uh, position. So Josie's back there. I'm sad to go, but I know Baltimore County is in good hands. Um, and finally, I was recently made aware that tonight is going to be the wonderful Romaine Williams final member as a Board of Education, of the Board of Education. And I'd like to take a moment to thank you. You were the first friendly face I met on the board. Um, you came to my swearing in, and I really appreciate um, all you've done for me this year. So thanks, Romaine. Very good. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will uh, refer concerns to the superintendent. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this system, it is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I ask you to observe the three-minute clock, which is uh, in front of you when you come up. Uh, it will let you know when your time is up. Please conclu conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that your time has expired. Um, I now call on our advisory groups to speak. And the first is the Baltimore County Student Council. And we ask uh, Jordan Wilson to come forward. <coughs> Hello, Jordan. So, uh, I always love following up after Aislin, but she did steal my thunder a little bit. So I apologize if I repeat some stuff. Um, but so good evening, everyone. I hope you all have fantastic spring break. Um, the days before our break started were very busy for the many students of Baltimore County who went to Ocean City for the annual Maryland Association of Student Council Convention. Um, this three-day trip for over 700 students from all over the state provided many opportunities and acknowledgments for Team BCPS. We had eight BCPS students facilitate three different workshops for other student leaders in addition to advisor-led workshops, allowing both students and teachers to impart their leadership knowledge upon others. We had a student running for a statewide office with over 15 other BCPS student leaders serving on her campaign staff. Although she did not win, it was an incredible opportunity for everyone. The principal of Hereford High School, Mr. Jaira, was also asked to serve on an advisor panel where he discussed how he supports student leadership in his building. 
What he did not know was that was that night he would also be awarded the MASC Principal of the Year Award to recognize him for all of his incredible support and leadership. BCPS won many accolades at the award ceremony. In addition to Principal of the Year, Hereford High School was also recognized for hosting the MASC Fall Leadership Conference with over 30 student leaders from around the county. The incredible Hereford High School advisors, Mrs. Watkins and Ms. Aim, were nominated for MASC Advisor of the Year, but unfortunately did not win. Mm -hmm. um, Perry Hall High School received the Felix Simon Award to recognize their outstanding student council and all of its accomplishments this year. Overall, it was an amazing event for all of BCPS and BCSC. Now, a quick plug, Aislinn talked about it really fast, but next Thursday at Meadowood Regional Park from 6 to 7.30, BCSC will be hosting our first 5K walk slash run to benefit Finnish sarcoma. Um, which is the organization that our students chose to adopt this year as our charity. Um, if you're interested in attending, please go to finishsarcoma.org for more information and to register. We would love for, to have you all there um, and to make this event as great as it possibly can be. Um, now, today it was announced that Dr. Dance is resigning his position as superintendent of BCPS at the end of this school year. On behalf of BCSC, I would like to thank Dr. Dance for all of his hard work and incredible leadership. He has helped to move the county forward and to engage more students in their education. All of us from BCSC value the relationship he has forged with our organization. He has been recognized formally as, the M as a friend of MASC and informally as our friend and mentor. As the search begins for replacement, I hope that the student voice will continue to be heard, as it is ultimately that voice that matters the most. This Friday is our last BCSC General Assembly, and a new batch of officers will be elected, including my own replacement. I look forward to seeing the relationship between our organization, the Board of Ed, and our new superintendent continue to grow. So thank you very much, Dr. Dance, for your leadership, and best of luck in all of your future endeavors. Thank you all. Thank you, Jordan. Our next uh, advisory group uh, is TABCO, and I invite the newly re-elected uh, Abby Baton. Thank you. Good evening, Chairman Gillis, Chairwoman Johnson, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. I hope everyone had the opportunity to spend time with family and friends during the past spring break and holidays. I know it was needed by all. I was originally going to talk about a different topic, but with the announcement today about Dr. Dance's resignation from BCPS at the end of the school year, I felt it only appropriate that I change the focus of my remarks. I would like to take this time to thank Dr. Dance. I can say he has poured his heart and soul into our schools and worked tirelessly during his time here. I don't think there's anyone who would disagree. I have always understood his desire to do what is best for Baltimore County Public Schools and his quest to bring his vision to our schools. While we have not always agreed on how, when, and even where to move that, that vision forward, I have always known that his heart was in the right place trying to do what was best for students. Sometimes in the rush to get projects done, there were unintended consequences and time commitments that became troubling. However, we have begun to collaborate earlier in the process to help avoid some of the pitfalls we have encouraged and encountered in the past. Discouraged, excuse me. We wish Dr. Dance well in whatever path he chooses next in his life. I have no doubt that in the future we will be hearing about Dr. Dance. He can't sit still for very long. Congratulations. One more. So this is very near and dear to me because we have really become fast friends, but I would like to say a few words about Romaine Williams. As she leaves her seat on the Board of Education, I am so sorry. Romaine has always been a class act. She has devoted much of her time to the Policy Review Committee, and her work on board policies has been invaluable, as well as all of her work on this board. She will be greatly missed. Enjoy. Thank you, Abby. Our next speaker is from the ESPBC. That's uh, Lila Marinbloom. Good evening, Dr. Dance and members of the Board of Education. 
I would personally like to thank Dr. Dance for his many years of dedicated service to the students and staff of Baltimore County Public Schools. Your leadership and vision has helped set the tone for the quality education BCPS provides for every student. It is on this thought that I ask you and the board to reconsider your stance on the decision to deny classroom paraeducators their own tablets to use in the classroom. As you know, one of the classroom para's duties is to reteach, that is to assist students who need extra reinforcement in order to master a skill or retain facts. Since many of our students' lessons are contained within the tablet, wouldn't it be educationally sound for the person working with these students to have their own tablet and knowledge of its use in order to facilitate the reteaching rather than not knowing how to assist a student when they are using their own tablets? Finally, the subject of the use of Kronos must be reconsidered also. Many of my members have been complaining about having to lose up to 10 minutes of their lunch period in order to walk to the office to swipe out, gather their lunch, walk to wherever they eat their lunch, walk back to the office, and report to their next classroom on, and on time. I realize that money has been spent on placing chronos in every school for the purpose of verifying our taking our lunch breaks. However, how many lunches have been verified since the use of Kronos was initiated? More importantly, how many hours of my members' lunch periods have been lost due to their having to use Kronos? <coughs> Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Dallas for his service, and I wish him good luck in his future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker from the Northeast Area Advisory Council is Thor Trigvison. Good evening, board members. Christmas came early in 2017 with news of a new middle school in the Perry Hall area. I would like to take this opportunity to personally thank Dr. Dance for lighting the path uh, for the board and the county executive to fund and plan a new middle school in the Northeastern region. It is with profound gratitude that I, as a parent of children in Perry Hall, am able to look forward and see a light at the end of the tunnel for my children. On behalf of the Northeast Area Educational Advisory Council, teachers, parents, students, and others in Perry Hall, I would like to convey a message of thanks and gratitude for the work that the board has done so far and the work ahead that the board has committed to do in the future. To complete the build of a new middle school by 2021 in Northeast area and the expansion of Pine Grove Middle is nothing short of a magnificent feat. This new middle school will be the first new middle school in 43 years in the area. While this is very exciting and positive news for the area, that there is a vision to permanently address the overcrowding in the Northeast area, at least for the foreseeable future, I would like to take this opportunity to ask all members on the board to keep in mind the overcrowding situation at Perry Hall Middle and to seek a temporary solution to alleviate the overcrowding until a new school has been built and a comprehensive survey has been completed by BCPS. Unfortunately, we cannot dwell in the luxury of waiting for a new school to solve the overcrowding at Perry Hall. With a blueprint in hand for two new elementary schools in the area, a full rebuild of one elementary school doubling its size to address the issue of more than 1,600 students above state rated maximum, and a new middle school to receive all the additional students on a fast track to building, you will most certainly see less of me in the BCPS board meetings, <laughs> for now. That is to say, until there will be a dire need for a new high school in Perry Hall, speaking of, Perry Hall High School will be at maximum capacity in five years. Again, I, parents in Perry Hall, the Northeast Educational Advisory Council members and others would like to thank each and every one of you for making this happen, and especially Dr. Dance for taking the lead on the matter and finding a long sought solution for the area. Dr. Dance, in light of today's news, we wish you continued success in future ventures 
wherever they may be, and we thank you for your work for the children and parents in the Baltimore County area. Thank you. Thank you. Our first speaker in the public comment portion of our meeting is Jasmine Shriver. Ms. Shriver. Uh, pick anyone. Uh, my name is Jasmine Schreiber. Many of you do know me. Um, those who don't, I'm not going to go through my credentials as a volunteer um, advocate for special education and minority achievement. I will tell you that I served for 10 years on the Achievement Initiative for Maryland Minority Students, and four of those years, Maryland was ranked number one. Um, I, Dr. Danz, I applaud you for making it five years. Um, the, <laughs> and uh, I really do. I've never seen an Energizer bunny like you, but I'm also worried, and I came before this board because I wanted Dr. Danz's contract to be renewed, but I was also worried at that time that we were going to get an interim superintendent. And I just, this board's makeup is going to change in 2018. And I just want to make sure we don't have a warm body in that position. Because everything that Dr. Dance has worked for, I've seen it. Um, you know, I've seen this happen in the past. Can just all be diluted. Um, he might, you know, whoever the interim superintendent is, I can't think of a person within the school system who could do as good a job as you, Dr. Dance. So I just, the main focus of this board, please, is to find an interim, not a warm body, because that interim, according to Maryland law, is going to have to serve one full year, even if you hire a new superintendent in October. You're going to have that interim for one entire year, and I would hope you would have the qualities and traits of Dr. Dance. Also, Dr. Dance, I also, you and I, I have always been interested in the improvement of African American male achievement. And I know we have started work on that committee, and I just, no matter who the superintendent or who, no matter what, I just want to assure you that that is going to be my main focus, because the school to prison pipeline and what we're doing to African American males in this country is criminal. So I wish you nothing but the best, and you can rest assured that I'm going to be taking care of the equity and excellence in Baltimore County as a volunteer on the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schreiber. Next is Stephanie Egbu Jonuma. junior. Walking into high school, I had the mindset that I was going to be a stellar student. And in my ninth grade year, I, I did good, but I was not an AVID. When I saw my friends excelling in AVID, through AVID, I, I thought I had to make a change. I, I thought that I was okay, but I, without being an AVID, it made me strive to want to be an avid because I knew I would be a better person and it would help me motivate myself to do better and do it for myself. I come from a home that college, going to college is, is <laughs> like not going to college is not an option, but avid made me want to do it for myself. You know, have a, create a future, a bright one for myself. And through avid, I've had I've had a really good experience. It's helped me prep for the SATs, and it's given me um, an insight on what I need to look for, like what colleges look for, and I have to change myself as a person mentally and academically so I can step into the shoes of a true college student. And 
I know she's not here, but Miss Mafa, which is our avid coordinator from Overly, she's really helped me through that. And there's been times where I felt like I can't do it or things aren't working for me, but when you sit down with someone like Miss Mafa and you just work through everything, you can see that there is always a way with Avid. So I would like you guys to keep helping Avid. <laughs> 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 when I say Avid, you say rock. Avid, rock. rock. Avid, rock. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next speaker is D Jaliah Jefferson. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh. Participating in the Avid College Readiness Program has helped me a lot because I used to struggle with reading, but since I've been at Avid, Ms. Natal has taught me how to annotate. I'm actually doing better with reading. My goal in life is to be a lawyer and be successful. Since I've been at Avid, I'm getting closer and closer to my goal. Doing tutorials is part of being a lawyer and being able to bond with a group of people is also part of being a good lawyer. When I graduate middle school, I'll be ready for the next chapter of my life. Avid has taught me to be humble and it has motivated me to pursue a career in law. I have learned humility and motivating and motivated are fine virtues to have. Before I was in Avid, I really didn't care about recycling, but now I turn in dry sheets, candles, and chip bags so that my class to get closer to my goal, I will continue to work hard in school and stay out of trouble. When I graduate high school, I want to go to the University of Maryland College Park and work hard. I decided I wanted to go there because I want to pursue my dreams and also make my mom and teachers happy and show them that if nobody else listened to them lecture, I did and I learned and grew from it. As a result, I was accepted into the early college program. I will be the first graduating class of 2021. One. Thank you, July. Our next speaker is Sasha Long. Hello, my name is Satia Long. Satia. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm an avid senior at Patapsco High School. I've been an avid throughout my whole high school career. And starting avid freshman year, I can definitely see how avid has changed me as a person. I like how AVID prepares me for what I'm going to do after high school. My freshman year, I didn't really have a goal. I knew that I was going to go to college, but I, I didn't know like what college, if I was going to end up at CCBC or if I'm going to go to a four-year. Of course, I'm going to a four-year as soon as I graduate. Um, what I like about AVID is the tutorials. It really helps a lot. Having a full class period to help out with having your peers help you with whatever you're struggling with. I also like the Cornell notes that really helps do, especially for my AP classes, specifically economics, knowing how to take notes and then retake notes in order to pass the test and study. Um, I also love the relationships I've built through AVID, especially with my AVID teachers. And not only the AVID teacher that I have, but any AVID teacher in the building. I like how I can walk up to any AVID teacher and they can give me advice. Um, especially with applying to colleges, I've realized um, in my high school, Lots of people graduate my high school without a plan. I like how uh, AVID helps me have a plan after high school. Also, I've, I noticed that I'm way more prepared than other students in my high school. Like, I have a sister, a twin sister, who's not an AVID. I realized that I was, I was always a step ahead. I always, my AVID teacher always told me what scholarships were out, um, what I needed to do. Um, they, uh, he helped me with my essay, helped me with SAT prepping. And talking to my sister, she always thought it was um, unfair that she never had those advantages, mm -hmm. having a class peer just to prepare. And of course, like I would take it home and help her out, but <laughs> Abbott's, really, uh, <laughs> Abbott's really meant a lot to me. I like, um, especially with the financial part, um, I like that my AVID teacher specifically, well, all the AVID teachers at Patapsco, really go the extra mile. Like, I know that I was struggling with uh, going into college without, like, declaring a major. I don't know why that was just such a problem for me. But then my AVID teacher, Meninsky, he brought in all his colleagues to explain, like, what uh, college they went to, their career path, and, like, making me understand that it's okay if you change your uh, major and it's okay if you're undecided. It's 
it's fine. I really appreciate that they go the extra mile. I appreciate the avid field trip where we got to look at different colleges to really know if I wanted to be in like an urban area or a rural area. Don't want to be in a rural area. <laughs> but I would com if I can look at myself my freshman year and look at myself my senior year, honestly, I, I changed so much. I've become such a better person, more organized more smarter, and I just want to thank all my AVID teachers, and I really love this program. I think it should be, I think, I think all students should be in this program. It could be very beneficial. Thank you for Thank you, Sophia. <laughs> Our next speaker is Lauren Marlowe. Yeah. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Lauren Morlock. It's fine. It happens. Um, I am honored to be the AVID coordinator for Pikesville Middle School for the 2017-28 school year. Um, this year alone, I've already learned so much about the program and seen how my students are reacting to this program. The ability to tell a student, a scholar, that you have not only the opportunity, but you have the potential. It's already there within you. Even today, I got to speak to my students, the incoming eighth grade class, who will be the leaders of our school next year. And I said to the 96 of the, two, of the 397, hey guys, you were picked to be in this program. And the way they responded was not only so positive, but it was rejuvenating as an educator to see my students truly understand the potential that they have. And the community behind this AVID program has really inspired me. I know that there is, wherever I turn, a colleague I can turn to, someone who can help me out. Heather's been amazing. And all of the students who I've seen in the program who truly excel and want to do better, not for their parents or for their family, but for themselves. They understand their own potential. And I think to take away from that program would be a shame. It would really hurt our students. And I cannot tell you how honored I am that I am a part of this program for next year, and hopefully for years to come, that we can continue to show our students that they don't have to have straight A's or they don't have to be the best students just to know that they have the potential to be the best and to be the best they can be. And as we teach in our classrooms every day, actions speak louder than words. So if you're avid and you know it, clap your hands. Thank you. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lauren Brown. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Lauren Brown. I am a third year social studies teacher at Overly High School. It is my privilege to speak on behalf of AVID tonight. Um, I cannot speak to in depth about AVID as I have just become involved in the past month or so. Um, however, I am preparing to be AVID coordinator next year and I'm very excited. And what I have to say um, will have much less of an impact than what our students have said so far as they are the living proof that AVID truly works. In preparing for my role next year, I have been speaking with current students like the ones who have spoken this evening and they all have attributed their success and academic growth to the AVID strategies that we incorporate into the AVID classrooms. From the Cornell notes to the tutorials, they have truly prepared them to be college and career ready, and I couldn't be more excited to be part of this amazing program, and I only hope that we can further support and push this within the county. If you're AVID and you know it, clap your hands. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kimberly Munchell. Good evening. I'm not from AVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, I come before you tonight to express concern for special education students in Baltimore County, specifically those with autism. My name is Kimberly Munchell and I teach second grade here in the county. Since the adaptive learning support program was reassigned to home schools, several students with autism have been included in my general education classroom. While there are undoubtedly benefits for typical students and students with autism being together, as a whole, this situation is likely causing harm to both of these groups. Students with autism come to home schools without the support they would have received had they been in a regional program. They have come from a setting where the pupil-student ratio was approximately one teacher to six to eight students with an instructional assistant. 
Now they enter the general education classroom with 20 or more students and one teacher and an additional adult assistant. They do not have access to a sensory room which would greatly benefit their readiness to learn. There's no crisis room. Staff, including myself, and the additional adults working with these students have not had any specific training in how to effectively support these children. When a child is emotionally labile, it upsets the learning of all other students in that classroom. And in my case, my school is an open space school, and so it can also reach into other classrooms. If the student is removed, there is no safe and effective place within the school for them to calm down and de-escalate. At our school, when looking for a safe place for de-escalation, we either have to remove all of the typical students from their classroom, or move support staff out of their offices, install childproof locks, remove all throwable objects, and position staff in pairs in a situation where the staff are in harm's way. I myself have been kicked and cursed by a student with autism who was out of control for a week and a half. Another staff member was purposely urinated upon. Because some students have such significant needs and yet there are no appropriate settings provided nor appropriately trained staff to meet their needs and teach them, very vulnerable students are receiving an ineffective education. This leaves students with autism without the individualized supports that are crucial to their progress. It leaves the other students in the classroom holding their ears and crying because of the screaming that goes on for days or sometimes weeks at a stretch. Students can't learn well in this environment. Teachers cannot, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Michelle Natal. Hello, I have the honor to speak on behalf of AVID for today. So being an AVID instructor um, and then also the AVID coordinator at Southwest Academy, I feel like what the students have said is a huge impact. So for today, I'm speaking on behalf of one of the AVID eighth graders, Nyla. She says, AVID is a college and readiness class that I have been a part of for two years. AVID's mission is to close the achievement gap by preparing all students for college readiness and success in a global society. AVID has helped me better organize because of tutorial request forms. They let me put my thoughts onto paper and solve what I don't understand. Cornell note-taking is a strategy that lets me create notes on paper of a new lesson in school. Those strategies impacted my life because I have never been more organized, but I, I have never been the most organized person. But they have helped me out, they have helped out my challenges with that. Visiting colleges last year helped me decide what college I want to go to. And when that time comes, which university, when that time comes, I would like to attend University of Maryland College Park. It has also helped me to know what campus life is like. Overall, I think that AVID has given me a better sense of the world and my environment. The service projects that I do have shown me that the little things you do affect everyone, and even one hour of helping out is giving back to the community. Discover, which is part of the 2017 Summer Institute theme, which means you are figuring out what learning style works best for you and what career you enjoy. Engage means to be involved in your academics and being an advocate for your grades. Lastly, I think that success is implied that you are going to achieve your goals, whether whether it's a short-term one or a long-term one. In conclusion, that is what I think AVID and why it helps me excel in life and school. I hope that I can continue AVID throughout my high school career. 
This statement has really impacted me being an AVID coordinator, and Southwest Academy is one of 18 middle schools to have AVID, and my hopes are as we move forward that all of our middle schools will have an AVID program and we can expand into the elementary schools as well because this is a program that really touches students and it really helps them advance via individual determination. So if you're AVID and you know it, clap your hands. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Chris Zach. Good evening, board members and Dr. Dance. Uh, as treasurer of the uh, Lansdowne High School PTSA and as president pro temp of the Relay Improvement Association, I bring you warm and fraternal greetings from the citizens of Relay, as well as the students and teachers of Lansdowne High School. I and the other parents of Lansdowne are here tonight to discuss the status of the extensive renovations that were planned for and now are slightly delayed over at the high school. While we were hoping to start over the summer and get this underway, we understand it was determined that more extensive mm, renovations uh, were needed than originally budgeted. We understand significant structural foundation work, uh, plumbing issues, not usable water fountains, the ADA compliance issues, the HVAC problems, the mold issues, the flooding in the orchestra pit, and of course the collapse of several bathroom room ceilings do require time and care to properly remediate. I will say I'm very glad the board is not just doing a quick fix for the school, but instead is looking for a more permanent solution that would address these issues. Although, I will say the physical condition of the school is ranked as the lowest in the county, please rest assured that the students and teachers there, including my two children, are top notch and they receive an excellent education despite the physical issues. We very much appreciate that. Thus, we're looking forward to a first class renovation in the spirit of what was done at our schools, such as Catonsville Elementary, which I went through, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. And that will return Lansdowne School to a top notch facility and an example of what Baltimore County provides to all of its students. We appreciate the letter we received from Kevin Kamenetz. I have not yet had a chance to read it, it just came in, but we are looking forward to partnering with everyone to make this a success. Finally, I will say that doing this right would be an excellent crowning achievement for the board, the county, the students, and of course you, Dr. Dance, as you take leave of us at the end of the school year. Thank you very much. I wish you best, best wishes in wherever you go, and thank you all. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Good evening, education leaders. Good evening. I've learned many lessons as a parent entering my son in this education competition seven years ago. Transitioning my son from a small majority African American Christian school in Baltimore City to a larger, more diverse school system in Baltimore County taught me a lot about race relations as well as the political inequities in education. On a larger scale, I've recognized more deeply as a person that several private and public entities are celebrating and capitalizing off the defeat and lack of knowledge that some people of certain races, religions, and communities have. For example, just being unaware of education policy as common citizens could unfortunately influence some leaders to unlawfully take advantage of you and your children. So I urge parents, employees, students to inform yourself about the policies that may affect you. Furthermore, leaders who lack compassion and respect for certain minority groups' grievances can cause climate issues within organizations 
impossible legal disputes to be judged outside of the organization. Moreover, the lack of resources and unequal opportunities in certain communities are a direct result from the inequities in education and employment. So what can we do differently as a global community to resolve this? My simple suggestion is just to get involved, especially African Americans, Hispanic Americans. Your leadership and your voice is needed to guide us. It is quiet as a mouse in here. <laughs> mm. I'm so grateful. <laughs> For the good. This was not planned. I was not supposed to cry. It's your fault, Dr. Dance. <laughs> Just the way you can hear you. Go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Thank you. Our next agenda item is item I, and it's personnel matters. And for that, I invite Dr. Mayo to come forward. appointments and area education advisory council appointments do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters I one through I seven so moved is there a second second any discussion all in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. Uh, the motion carries thank you thank you next on our agenda is dr. dance thank you mr. chair members of the board before I um, it's, ask for approval for the administrative appointments this evening. Um, one, as a former AVID student, I would just like to take a moment of personal privilege to ask all of our AVID students to please stand up so we can personally recognize <laughs> you. say that AVID gives you a level of personal confidence that we saw this evening with our students. And one of the highlights of every single school year is um, addressing the high school seniors who have been members of our AVID program. So thank you for your advocacy and coming out this evening. Um, Chairman Gillis, members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Principal of Southwest Academy, Assistant Principal of Chesapeake High School, Coordinator of Strategic Planning in the Department of Research, Accountability and Assessment, and Business Manager in the Office of Transportation. And do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters in J1? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. There you go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, before I announce the new principal of Southwest Academy, if I could just ask Ms. Karen Barnes if she could please stand up so we can thank her for her leadership and the years of service she's given to education. Thank you, Karen, for allowing me to do that, and I know you'll kill me later. Um, <laughs> but Karen has actually um, developed many of our leaders within our school system and across the state and the country, so thank you for what you've done, Karen. You'll be working with us next year a little bit as well, too, as we prepare future leaders. But the new principal of Southwest Academy, um, currently right now an assistant principal at Pikesville Middle School, that's Ms. April Franklin. April, do you have any family or friends here with you this evening celebrating? I do. I have a whole world celebrating. Introduce them to us so they can stand up and be recognized. I have my friend Marte Noggin. Okay, you can stand up so we can recognize you. There you go. My sister, Shana Franklin. My current principal, Kalisha Miller, high school middle. And of course, Ms. Karen Barnes, current principal at Southwest.
Thank you, April, and congratulations to all of you. We look forward to the work you're going to do at Southwest Academy. Assistant Principal of Chesapeake High School, currently right now an English teacher at Owings Mills High School, that's Ms. Amanda First. <laughs> Amanda, do you have any family or friends here with you this evening? Yes, I have uh, my boyfriend, Sarah Fox. You stand up so we can recognize you, too. Uh. <laughs> Congratulations, all. <laughs> Congratulations, Amanda. I know Jess is very, very happy. Abby is not, though. <laughs> She's excited about your promotion. Next is for the business manager position in the Office of Transportation, currently right now an information systems specialist in that office. That's Kimberly Kerr. <laughs> and Kimberly, do you have any family or friends here with you celebrating tonight? Introduce your mom and dad for us so they can stand up as well and be recognized. <laughs> Thank you, Kim, and congratulations on your promotion. Last but not least is coordinator for strategic planning in the Department of Research, Accountability, and Assessment, and currently right now a specialist in that same department. That's Melissa Appler. <laughs> Melissa, do you have any family or friends here with you this evening? Congratulations to you. Dr. Brown did just text me, so he's extremely excited about your promotion. So congratulations to you. Mr. Chair, this is not this is not as an administrative appointment because it is a transfer, but I would like to announce that the principal of the new Northeast Elementary School will be Charlene Banky from Vincent Farms Elementary School. Um, Charlene, because she's a current principal, is a transfer, so it doesn't have to go before for board approval. But I wanted to publicly acknowledge Charlene for the work she's done at Vincent Farm and the work that we have to do over the next literally 14 to 16 months as we prepare for the opening in August of 18 for the new Northeast Elementary School. We will be advertising Vincent Farms Elementary School momentarily, and we'll be going through the process with the community on finding a replacement. With that, Mr. Chair, it concludes the administrative appointments. Thank you very much. Uh, next on our agenda is a matter of new business, the proposed board meeting schedule for 2017-18. Uh, that schedule is attached to the agenda item. Um, and all meetings will begin at 6.30 p.m. Do I have a motion to adopt the schedule for the board meetings in 2017-18? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any questions? Mrs. Miller. Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm reading the calendar correctly, um, but it appears that there is only one work session for the budget, where we're supposed to have two work sessions if to we consider need a, the budget. If we need a second work session, we'll schedule one. Was that not a motion that the board I adopted? Think for last year it was, yes. We have to do it every year, you're saying? Well, I, I think that's what, what the motion was last year. Well, I don't think a time frame was specified for it. Right, it wasn't um, permanent. It wasn't, the motion was not permanency. Yeah. It was made, so it was if made for the current year. So, Mrs. Miller, if there's need for another one, uh, we will certainly schedule one. When will we know that need? It'll be upon us when we, before we know it. So perhaps it's something that we should discuss and maybe make a change to the calendar. Okay. So I would move that the board consider uh, during our next administrative uh, function session um, adding additional work sessions for the budget. Okay. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor of, of uh, discussion at the next, next administrative function session, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. It'll be discussed at the next administrative s function session. Thank you. All right. With that, uh, all in favor of the um, meeting schedule for 2017-18 as presented, uh, please say aye. I don't aye. see how we can vote on it since we just said we would be discussing a change. We can we can amend it if the if the need arises. Okay. Thank you. All right. So the motion is on the floor. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed. There's one opposition. Motion carries. 
Next on our agenda is uh, item L, contract awards, and for that I call Mr. McDaniels. Thank you, Mr. Gillis. The uh, Board's Building and Contract Committee met earlier this evening and are, are, is forwarding items L1 through L10 to the full board for consideration. All right. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Uh, is there any discussion? Mrs. Miller. Um, on number eight, I just had some questions, and we don't necessarily need to break anything out, uh, but I had questions on number eight and number ten. Very good. Please for, proceed. Okay. For number eight, um, it states it, it states that there is a guarantee of a 200-point increase if a student logs basically 50 hours on the software. Um, so what... When is the student going to be using the software? It was discussed during the committee that it could be um, done independently by the student. Does that mean it would be outside of school that the students would be uh, logging that time, or is it inside classroom time? Good evening, Ms. Miller. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, A little you hear me bit. now? Yes. Um, <laughs> All of the above. So this program can, students would have access and those hours would run the duration of the school year. So ideally students would have access to this on the first day of school. And so those hours would be logged over time. A student could spend 15 minutes on it um, during lunchtime. They could spend 20 minutes on at, at homework or they could spend time in their classroom once. So it's versatile in that manner. Thank you. And it says that uh, it will be provided for students in grade 11 <laughs> who scored less than 1250 on their first SAT. So they really wouldn't be able to use it from day one in 11th grade, not until after they had taken the SAT and received scores back. Actually, that's not accurate. They, what we can use as their baseline is their first SAT is their 10th grade PSAT score can serve as that baseline. Okay. Um, and that's what it says in the contract then? Yes. Okay. Um, and does the contract have any usage requirements? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by usage requirements. Uh, like requirements that students use the program for a certain period of time given that there's a guarantee. Yes, as written in the contract, uh, in order for the guarantee to hold in place, uh, a student needs to use the program with fidelity as uh, specified. So the, a student needs to um, complete the activities, the practice test, um, and the time um, on task in order for the guarantee to hold. If a student doesn't meet the 200-point gain, uh, that's when the guarantee kicks in. If a student has not implemented the program with fidelity, then the guarantee does not follow. Okay, so um, like with Dreambox, there's target usage mm -hmm. requirement, not mm -hmm. requirements, but targets. So would this then be a target that teachers would be pushing students to achieve that 50 hours? Again, the guarantee goes if the, st the guarantee upholds to the hours, okay? So depending upon how... Um, how many points a student needs to improve, you may have a student who comes in at 1225 and they don't really need to move their score by 200 points, so they may not need to have um, 25 hours to be able to get the data back and the adaptive um, reporting feature to see their improvement. So in that regard, it's very personalized to a student's uh, growth measure. All right, does anyone else have any questions about item eight? Ms. Bratt. Um, my question, so I just had two. Um, one, is there in-school support for the use of this program? So would a teacher be assisting the students? Yes, so this would be a supplemental resource that a teacher would be able to assign to students. And so a teacher has, uh, there's reporting features that the teacher can pull and understand, um, you know, I may have six students who I need to really help focus them on this particular content or skill. I may have another seven students who I need to focus on, on something different. So this is not meant to be a, uh, you plug and play and students just take care of themselves. This is really optimal um, if you have a teacher using it as a resource instructionally. Oh, okay, thank you, that makes a lot of sense. Mrs. Um, Jones, oops, I'm sorry. Sorry, I just have one more question. Yes, um, can you uh, describe to me the difference? So there is another free program that I know we use at my school, which is Khan Academy, mm -hmm. which the College Board provides for free. Um, what's the value 
difference for this particular program? Right, thank you. I know Ms. Hen asked that question earlier today, and and, um, and the difference really is that you're getting real-time feedback, adaptive feedback, as opposed to Khan Academy, you're getting um, post-score um, feedback with a static set of questions that you, you um, work through. Um, with the adaptive capability and prep works, depending upon which distractors you incorrectly choose, it then adjusts what your next practice question is. So it's real-time mentoring and coaching in response to what your your um, your mistake answer is in a way that um, optimizes our time on tasks as opposed to uh, working through a set of questions and to responses that you gave four months ago. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. So I mentioned this in PRC, I, or I'm sorry, in Curriculum Committee or PRC. Um, I am going to be voting against this because if I'm looking at things through uh, the, our equity lens policy 100, to offer a program to 4,000 students when I'm going to assume that there's probably more than 4,000 students in the county that scored lower than the 1250. And I couldn't get a definitive answer of what, what classrooms will be using this. So to have one student who scored lower than a 1250 you, being able to utilize this program sitting next to another student who scored lower than a 1250 who then can't use the program in the same classroom. So I'm going to be voting against this for that very issue. All right, we'll segregate item eight. But before we do, Mrs. Miller has another question on that same item. <coughs> Just one more question. Sure. What does that guarantee mean? So if a student puts in the hours but doesn't achieve the 200-point gain, what's the result? Yes, that is our favorite question today. Um, what the guarantee does, if I as a student start and I, I implement the program with fidelity, I work through it, I still do not achieve a 200-point gain. What we as a district do um, through this guarantee is that student um, gets a full year free subscription to continue to use the program. And the, the subscription that we had paid for, we're then able to issue out. So essentially, that student follows up with a free year of the program from uh, the company. And I'm sorry, I lied. One more question. Okay. <laughs> this, <Columbia>. um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, th this contract, this contractor will have to sign our new student privacy agreement. Is that right? Yes, and they have reviewed that, and they are uh, willing and able to sign that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you also had a question about number 10, or do you want to segregate that? Um, I, don't, I don't need to segregate okay, it. I just have some questions. Um, so this is number 10, hold on, I got to get to it. Capital Program Consultation Services. Okay. All right. And that is to develop uh, a contract consulting services to help us review educational facilities master plan. So could this vendor assist the board in developing a prioritized 10-year facilities master plan, and I know Ms. Causey has spoken on this a number of times, something similar to what Anne Arundel County does. Could this no, contract do that? No, that's not the intent of this contract. That will need a larger contract, and that has already been done a couple of years ago with GWWO's contract. And what was the amount of that contract? <coughs> I don't recall the exact number. <clears throat> but it was it approximately five hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so it will be substantially more be substantial. than this one is. Um, so we have used consultants for that purpose. You're saying in the past, and that was what did you say three years ago? Or, it was or when in was two thousand thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Very good. So we have. Um, I'll ask for a, a motion or actually a vote on items. Uh, what is this letter? L. L1 through 7 and 9 and 10. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That carries. Now I'll ask for a vote on uh, L8. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, there are two in opposition. All of those contracts carry. Thank you very much. Uh, next on our agenda is item <coughs> M, and that is a budget appropriation transfer. And for that, Mr. Saris is already in his place. Yes, I've asked uh, Mr. Uh, Tantliff, our director of budget and reporting, to uh, summarize the document that 
uh, we have provided in the package. Very good. Thank Mr. you. Tantliff. Good evening. Um, in front of you, you'll find a budget appropriation transfer. We commonly call it a BAT request. Um, the BCPS budget consists of 13 separate appropriations by activities prescribed by MSDE. Transfers of funds between activities uh, requires approval from the Board of Ed and the County Council. Based on close monitoring expenditures through the first three quarters of FY17, our current full year expense projections show an overall surplus, but with shortfalls in some activities and surpluses in others. Because BCPS carries no contingency budget, the only way to manage changes in priorities and projected costs during the year is via amendments to the budget. We are projecting that overall we'll finish the year approximately $17 uh, million under budget. Available funds of, and uh, within the BAT, available funds of 1.35 million are coming from Activity One administration due to movement of some salaries in the reor in, during the reorg of the community superintendent offices with MSD guidelines. 3.6 million from Activity Three instructional salaries due to position vacancies. 250,000 from Activity Five and 4.25 million from activity 10 operation of plant due to reduced energy costs. Funds of one and a half million are requested for transfer into activity two, mid-level administration, to properly align some salaries in the reorganization of the community superintendent offices with MSD guidelines. A transfer of 2.75 million is requested for transfer into activity four, instructional textbooks and supplies to match school budgets uh, to the principal's final allocation. That was 2.5 million of it and $250,000 to purchase uh, Mid Middlebury instructional resources for the passport program. Funds of 1.9 million are requested transfer into activity six to provide funds required for non-public placements in special education a transfer of one and a half million in activity nine student transportation will provide funds for increased use of contractor buses due to BCPS driver vacancies. Um, and funds of 1.8 million are requested for transfer into activity 11 to require, um, to provide funds required for additional improvements at the Rosedale Center, which was $800,000 and renovation of the old Catonsville Elementary School building, which is approximately $1 million. We'll now take any questions you may have. Well, let's first uh, have a motion to approve the FY 2017 BAT budget appropriation transfer. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Now discussion. Any questions? Mrs. Miller. I have a few. Um, I just want to understand where, where this is and where it's all coming from. So regarding the reduction in instructional salaries, um, is this, this due to a, a higher than expected turnover? So does, is that surplus due to experienced higher paid teachers being replaced by newer lower paid teachers or more from teacher resignations that are unfilled and, and maybe have long-term subs? Um, it's a combination uh, of both buckets because every year we have the phenomena of obviously the most senior people retiring and generally being replaced with more uh, junior teachers. Um, we also have a vacancies throughout the year that, that HR is always trying to fill, but with an organization the size of ours, we always have uh, those vacancies. So. It's just based on um, the surplus uh, or the underspending we have due to those factors. And you don't have a feel for the breakdown of that? It's primarily the retirements and the replacements. The turnover is actually budgeted for. We, we take the full value of our salaries and we reduce that by 25 million or more before we even adopt a budget. So we're anticipating that much, but we really can't uh, project as precisely as the retirements. Okay, so it was more unanticipated yes. retirements. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, do, you do we have any, any, re, any ideas why the turnover rate in those retirements were higher than expected? Is that because More we budget very conservatively, no. Okay. 
Um, and that's a turnover rate that results in $3.6 million less being spent on instructional salaries. So uh, about how many people does that represent? Well, we're talking about a salary budget of about a billion dollars. So 3.6 million would be? It's a, a small percentage. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding the, uh, the admin transfer to the community superintendent structure, can you explain that transfer? What MSD guidelines are we not currently aligned with? Um, this is the uh, same phenomena we discussed during the budget process. Um, so just in review, after we did the initial planning and we uh, went through all of the final staffing, we determined that a number of the positions which had originally been budgeted in activity one were actually uh, more appropriately <coughs> budgeted in activity two. So the change here will align with the budget that the board um, adopted for 2018. The definition of a mid-level administrator is a school-based administrator. And a feature of the reorganization that, and we discussed this in January um, when we, when the superintendent introduced this budget, was um, that the definition uh, of a mid-level administrator is one who focuses on uh, supervision of principals and other school administrators and the structure reduced the number of um, high level administrators and increased the number of administrators in the schools to uh, assist and support school principals and and beyond that we actually placed their offices in schools to facilitate that role so this MSDE guidelines required something different than that? No, that's exactly what it required. But when we originally developed this reorganization in June of 2016, it was uh, really not in time to align with the 2017 budget. So it was always uh, intended to be adjusted this year. Because we have been repeatedly told that the new structure was supposed to be net neutral. It and is. It led the board to believe that it wasn't going to cost us anymore. And I know when we passed the budget, this issue came up. Why is it costing more? And now here again, it's costing even more. So that's a bit Th of a this concern. Isn't, this is just a movement between activities. It's not an increase in cost, what you're voting on tonight. Right. But, but you're it's, correct. It's During a the movement budget, we to that superintendent structure so that structure is costing us more than what we anticipated is the point i'm making um regarding the instructional textbooks and supplies can you explain what's being purchased under that category for 2.5 million dollars yeah that um, is that's yeah th that sorry um, the principals have wide latitude in how they spend the budgets that we allocate to the schools, and we don't put any constraints on them. So we have to do uh, an estimate, which we put in the budget based on historical spending patterns, but before the schools actually budget. So for instance, the schools are doing their budgets right now for 2018, but we've already locked in the budget for 2018. So every year, just because of timing and because we want to give the schools wide latitude to meet the educational needs of their students, um, there's always some misalignment just between activities. This is not um, in terms of their total budget. They are held accountable to stay on their total budget. But just within activities, we let them spend uh, as they see fit, and then we just adjust it as needed during this time period. Okay, so that's so be many the things school, spent the in school that. budget reallocation. Yes. And I was asking about the instructional textbooks and supplies. What is being purchased with that? That's two, two point five million. That's as well. all things within the schools. So it's it's hundreds and thousands of different purchases within the school to line up with how their uh, their actual spending patterns have occurred. So it's different based on every school. It's not a large single contract or anything like that. It's all the school purchases. Okay, that's number four, instructional textbooks and supplies? Correct. 
Okay, so I was reading that as though they were two separate line items, not one and the same. You're saying they're, that they're one category that includes dozens of different specific items. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So not just it's not just. In fact, it is probably less textbooks, textbooks than it is supplies because our textbooks are purchased centrally and coordinated to align with the curriculum. The only thing schools typically purchase are um, replacement textbooks. Okay, okay, I was just confused in how I was reading that, thank you. No um, on non-public placements, I'm concerned that the 1.9 million being asked for non-public placements may in part be due to a lack of resources going to special ed within the system. Um, the, the requirement is just due to growth in non-public placement, both in cost and number of students. So right now we have approximately 33 more students this year than last year, and that changes obviously every month. And an average student, uh, we budget uh, about $87,000, or $78,000, I mean, per student. So uh, it's just trends, growth trends in that category um, that we're seeing, and we're quite frankly just trying to play catch up each year on that. Okay, is it following kind of the same pattern that we're, we've been seeing? Yes, yes. Um, I think this year we were probably up by maybe 10% in terms of la where we is. started. We were about 39 million last year, and we're predicting to be about 42 million this year. So it's escalating a bit. Yeah. Uh, the improvements to the Rosedale Center, what is being done for the additional 1.8 million? Does that include a roof replacement? Um, uh, when the Rosedale Center um, was funded at the end of last year using preliminary estimates, so the final uh, budget for that project had to in be increased by about 800,000. So that's the space that we got into that were uh, we've had to renovate to make it accommodate the school. The but work was all completed yeah. before the school opened last year. We just uh, went in with uh, the best possible estimate into this sort of shell space and uh, try as we might. By the time we got done in November, it cost more than we had expected. That's already All right. been spent. Does, any, does anyone else have any more questions before I ask Ms. Miller if she has any more questions? All right. Just note a point of order that, in fact, um, the Rosedale Center edition um, was actually $800,000 as opposed to $1.8 million. Correct. Eight, 800000 additional Correct. from the original project cost. Thank you. Mrs. Miller, do you have another question? Yes. Um, the energy savings of $4.25 million. I know we voted on a contract on that, and I can't really recall that. It, that's an extensive energy savings. Where is that coming from? Um, electricity, natural gas. We had a very mild winter. Um, and just as prices have been dropping, we've had enough budget to more then cover that. I think as the energy savings projects have come fully online, we're also realizing those savings. So we, we fortunately um, are able to transfer money out of that category. Now we um, we took money out in the county, took additional money out of that budget next year, which we're comfortable with, but uh, we expect there to be less of a surplus in the future. Okay, and that basically came to us over the winter then, that amount, that's a lot. Okay. Yes. Uh, and on transportation, what are the primary reasons for driver vacancies? Um, are we not paying drive bus drivers? I'm not sure that we can answer that question um, other than to say we've uh, we worked with human resources, we've adjusted pay scales, um, we've discussed uh, negotiated incentives with the bargaining unit, and I think that it is part of a larger national issue. Good. And Mrs. Miller, if, if, if you want to, we can have that as a retreat topic. Um, it's really, I don't think, an appropriate topic to identify when we're talking about the need for a budget appropriation transfer. 
Well, let me ask a monetary question then. I assume then the cost to the system for more contractor buses is more than having BCPS buses and drivers. Is that right? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, we have uh, a motion and a second. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Brad, I'll remind you that you do not vote on this issue. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? There's one opposition. The motion, uh, the, the budget appropriation motion carries. And I'll leave this for the uh, superintendents and the chair's signature. Very good. Next is item N, new business, a report on policies first reading. For that, I call on our retiring PRC chair, Mrs. Williams. <coughs> With Board Chairman Gillis's permission as Chair of Policy Review Commission, uh, Committee, I will take a point of personal privilege for just a few minutes to first say good evening to everyone, to our valuable stakeholders and BCPS partners, to all BCPS staff and legal counsel, to my dear fellow board members who I will cherish and the wonderful friendships that have been made, <coughs> to Superintendent Dr. S. Dallas Dance, who will be especially missed and whose departure will be a tremendous loss for a BCPS, but I do believe the right decision for him at this time. I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you. I also want to publicly thank County Executive Kevin Kamenitz, Speaker Pro Tem Adrian Jones, State Senator and my Senator for many, many years, Senator Dolores Kelly, and Superintendent S. Dallas Dance for your confidence in me and recommendation of my appointment to first Governor Martin O'Malley back in March 2013, and then again to our current Governor Larry Hogan for my reappointment to my own board term. My resignation is effective at the end of the month as I and my husband relocate to Hartford County, Maryland to be closer to our daughter, son-in-law, and grandson. I will indeed miss BCPS and the work that I, together with so many of you, was able to accomplish. I am especially proud of the good work accomplished by the Policy Review Committee. It was a tremendous responsibility and a great honor to serve. I'm, it, I hope I don't cry. don't cry. I am sad. I will, really, really will miss this work. It is my hope that equity and excellence and joy remain at the forefront of the work of the board. I also wish to read into the record Governor Hogan's letter written to me and thank him for taking the time to do so. Romaine and Williams Esquire, dear Ms. Williams, it is with much regret that I acknowledge and accept your resignation as a member of the Baltimore County Board of Education. We have been fortunate to benefit from your interest and commitment to the work of the board, and I thank you for the contributions you have made during your tenure. Dedicated individuals like yourself who give so generously of their time and talent make it possible for us to maintain our commitment to provide quality and caring service to the people of the state. We are and shall remain indebted to you for the valuable assistance you have rendered through your participation. I wish you the very best in all your future endeavors. Sincerely, Lawrence J. Hogan, Jr., Governor. Again, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dance. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Aislinn, for your kind remarks about me and my work on the school board, and thank all of my fellow board members. Now on to finish my PRC duties. Um, <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the board, the Board of Education's Policy Review Committee has reviewed the policies presented to you for first read on tonight's board agenda as Exhibit N. The committee is recommending that the ethics policies, policies 8360, 8361, 8362, 8363, 8364, and 8365 be moved forward for second reader. Again, as you all know, that comments still can be uh, made uh, once uh, these policies have moved on to second reader. You will note that the discipline policies are not a part of this. I will address that issue momentarily. Um, staff is available should board members have any questions about the policies I've just requested to be moved forward for second reading. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? So moved. Second. 
No second is required, but we have one. Uh, but it's time for a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All righty. That carries. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. And now at this time. Oh, oops. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have one little quick break, and we're going to do uh, Dundalk Middle School, item O on the agenda, um, the LED sign project. Or do you I, need. Can, can I just finish, oh, please? Okay. Let's, Thank let's, you so much. We'll, I, Ms. Blannard, we'll just let you sit right there, and we're going to go on to item P. Um, let's see. Yeah, item P. Yes, um, because I apologize. I do need to leave. I have another commitment. Um, I will be traveling in the dark, um, <laughs> headed towards Washington, D.C. Um, as I exit. Um, with regard to the discipline policies 5550 and 5560, um, PRC believes that these policies are very, very important um, to our students and to everyone involved. We have received comments from um, our board member, Ann Miller, and the group of persons whom she has been working with, as well as from others. And so we are going to be, PRC is recommending tonight that we have a public hearing. Um, we're requesting this board to vote on a public hearing so that we can hear from the public as well as the comments that we have received um, from Ms. Miller and from the comments we've already received from staff concerning these policies and the um, efforts that they have put into uh, these uh, particular policies. I do want the board to understand that in voting um, that we have a public hearing and that no action, no further action will be taken on these policies to move them to third policy until after the public hearing. Uh, we will be um, recommending that the existing disciplinary policies be moved forward because they have to. I mean, they're going to stay in place, in other words, um, until we do resolve the matter with the hearing. So I just want to make sure everyone is clear on that. Okay, I'll accept that as a motion to schedule a uh, motion to schedule a public hearing on 5550 and 5560. Mr. Virch has seconded that. Any further discussion? Yes. Uh, very briefly, um, at the PRC meeting, it specifically was, you know, raised by me about the need for a public hearing on uh, behavior policies such as these. Romaine, in her comments uh, after the uh, PRC had, had voted, uh, made a note that, in fact, it would be recommended to our board. Uh, it was about a year ago that I met with one of our uh, BCPS parents, one of our then BCPS parents, Angie Thuman, who suggested the idea of a public hearing. It's not my idea. Uh, it really was her idea. Um, she thought there should be a, an opportunity for our parents and stakeholders, our teachers, our students to come and talk about their schools and uh, the behavior uh, uh, concerns that they might have had. And it actually uh, found its way to our retreat agenda. And uh, although I was operated on, it wasn't there. Mm -hmm. uh, it was on the agenda because Chuck, of course, was chair and made sure it was. Uh, the superintendent uh, commented on uh, uh, behavior uh, in September. And the matter has remained uh, sort of uh, there for us to pursue. And when these policies came, as you've heard uh, Romain say, that was a specific recommendation that came from the PRC. So um, Angie Thuman, if you're out there, just let you know, I want you to know that we did follow through. Thanks for the coffee and donuts at the uh, Dunkin' Donuts on Taylor Avenue. Uh, but uh, somebody did hear you, and uh, it is being followed through on tonight. I hope, with Very the support Any of the board. further discussion? Mrs. Johnson. Yes, I've got two things. Um, first is, uh, thank you for bringing that up, Chairwoman and Mr. Virch. We did discuss that at PRC. I want to make sure that the way that the documents float around here, that this packet will probably be uh, circulated throughout the county. I want to make something very clear that this, the, the additions or suggestions that were made brazenly violate, again, our equity policy. To cross out the word equitably and change it to equally is a violation of the policy. To use the word, the wording school administrator, it currently says school administrators uh, have the discretion. That is crossed out and says the authority to impose. The language is so strong, and we are talking about our, ch our children, not just my children, all of our children in the county, not just children that look a certain way or live in a certain, certain community. We're talking about all <coughs> of our children in the county. And ironically, that the prescription violation misuse of prescribed medication was moved from a Category 3 all the way down to a Category 1, which, mm. if you, you ever watch the news, you know who is most affected with the, with the prescription drug abuse. So. If, I don't know if a Shriver is still here, maybe next time, maybe at the uh, public hearing on Monday, she can explain what the school to prison pipeline really means and how this document will negatively affect our students in Baltimore County. 
Let's just, if I interrupt just a second, just to make clear, you're talking about a document that was circulated today and not about the PRC's report on Correct. 55, and, 50, and PRC has 60. not considered, not reviewed that document right. as a committee yet. Yes. That's so right. on a lighter note, because Ms. Uh, Williams, if, if it's not said publicly, you'll never believe that I said it. So it's on camera. You are here. And I just want to say thank you for your time as uh, chairwoman of the PRC. Thank you for your knowledge, your friendliness, your eagerness to, to listen to both sides, um, and your leadership here at Baltimore County Public Schools. You will be missed. My friend, I will miss you, but I'm sure I will see you out again. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Mrs. Miller, you wanted to say something. Yes, thank you. And I wanted to thank Ms. Williams also for her leadership with the PRC and specifically with these discipline policies, which I know she is uh, very concerned about discipline issues as well. Um, I want to thank all of those who met with me. There were a number of stakeholders that met with me from around the county, uh, representing all levels, you know, elementary, middle, and high, and um, were able to give input on uh, amendments to the discipline policies. One of the uh, outcomes of this is to realize how complex this issue is and how complex the policies are. And so this, the idea for uh, a public input hearing is, is really wise and a necessary thing. So I thank the PRC for that. Um, and I think it was a little premature to um, be picking apart some public input. Um, I hope that we can really look at all of the input and all of the issues from a variety of sources and angles and take the time to really put together something that will be effective for the entire system. All right. Uh, I think we're ready vote. for a vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Uh, we will have a public hearing on this matter, and we'll work with Mrs. Decker to schedule a time that uh, will um, satisfy Thank that. you so much, Chairman Gillis, Vice Chairman Marisol Johnson, Dr. Dance, and fellow board members. This is a so long. Get out of here. <laughs> Retiring. Exactly. There you go. Tired, but Just tired. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are going to jump back to O, uh, item O on the agenda, and that's Ms. Blannard. Good evening, Chair Gillis, Vice Chair Johnson, Dr. Dance, and members of the board. This evening, I'm seeking your approval with a privately funded capital project at Dundalk Middle School. Sellers Investors LLC is a developer within the Dundalk community, and they're providing a one-time donation in the amount of $29,520 to install a new school sign at Dundalk Middle School. <laughs> the 53-inch high by 66-inch wide LED double-face sign will be positioned in front of the main office area, <coughs> and it's equipped with cloud-based software and a light sensor for automatic dimming based on light conditions. The sign's comparable to the one at Dundalk High School, in the event you're familiar with that sign. And in accordance with policy and rule 7330, the project has been vetted with all internal BCPS offices for approval. We also have the principal of Dundalk Middle here joining us tonight, Mr. Seth Farish, in our audience. Seth! Seth has vetted this proposal with his PTA executive board, his school improvement team, and neighboring community members, and they're all in agreement that the sign will enhance school sure advertisement and enhance communication within the Dundalk community. Good. Do I have a motion to approve the LED sign at Dundalk Middle School? So moved. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Blannard. All right, it's time for public comment on policies. This is item P on our agenda. Um, 
We have uh, persons signed up to speak. The first is proposed changes to policy 1270, and that's Marion Moore. More policy one two seven zero. Good evening again. The the poli this po Ooh. <laughs> Okay, policy twelve seventy. This policy was a mandate in the Every Student Succeeds Act. So that means across our country, historically, some school officials really didn't care about hearing from or helping some of the racial or social groups because there was an economic agenda that did not have anything to do with the educational or career achievement of African Americans, for example. Title I schools' main demographic is African American. I just get straight to the point. <laughs> I have to. Um, I'm outnumbered, and it's very important that my race, uh, Hispanic race issues are addressed, and, and that's my purpose. <clears throat> Title I school's main demographic is African Americans or Hispanic students. So it's great that you will be uh, engaging parents more. Over the past five years, I noticed how the school system uh, have conducted a lot of market research through surveys, focus groups, and community uh, town hall meetings and hearings. However, lack of parent involvement is a nationwide issue. Sometimes that may be, cut, may be uh, because they have demanding uh, jobs that require a lot of their time. Some may not feel welcome at these meetings. Uh, they do not feel that their voices or concerns will be considered for decision making. Or the information um, that they may provide at these annual meetings may be used as institutional gossip and not necessarily used to help these individuals. Some parents simply fear speaking out passionately about issues that uh, they are facing because it may be used against them <laughs> or their children. In, poli in the policy analysis uh, section, uh, paragraph two, under the statement of issues, it states, this policy articulates that the board values and promote the engagement of all school, parent, guardian, family, and community members to ensure the academic and personal success of all students. And in my Mrs. Miller's voice, I hope this isn't just lip service. I hope you really mean this. I hope that you will engage parents. The last thing I would suggest is that I believe that superintendents should have an executive order of equity. So when people make you know, choices that benefit others and not other racial groups, that they can put their foot down for the, pe the voiceless. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Our next two items uh, are policy 5550 and 5560. As you heard, we have uh, just uh, voted to have a public hearing. We're going to proceed with this if you want to speak, but just know if you don't want to speak and you want to wait until the public hearing, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, 5550, the first speaker is Abby Baton. You may come up together. So, uh we're going to ask you if we can do 5550 and 5560 at the same time. You may do them both at the same time. I thought you would be happy with that. <laughs> and, uh, and this is? Cindy Sexton. Sexton. Okay. So one of the reasons, I mean, very happy with what you did tonight, but I don't think it went far enough, so that's one of the reasons we're going to speak again to it, okay? So policy 5550 and 5560, which deal with discipline, are definitely some of the most important policies the Board of Education has in its policy documents. And it is the number one topic of concern with our teachers. 
To that end, TABCO has formed a discipline committee to address these issues and work towards sensible solutions. We understand the needs of the students and staff to be safe and secure in their schools. This is a true crisis and it begs for the time and commitment from all to have the outcomes we are all seeking. Outcomes that will address the issues and help our students receive the best education possible without interference from other students as they access their learning. This committee will be working with BCPS officials as we find the best path or paths for improved student behaviors. We urge you to hold off making any changes, which you have done, so thank you, until the work necessary to move our system forward is much further along, not just a public hearing. We do not need to rush to make changes now that may be contraindicated by the findings of our committee and the work we do together with BCPS. In the meantime, gather the information and we appreciate that. However, please do not rush to make these changes. Rushing through it could end up hurt, hurting even more than helping. We need to start taking the time necessary to get these issues done correctly, not swiftly. I was going to go for the full three minutes, but I'll narrow it down. And I just want to uh, agree with everything Abby has said. TABCO has created a discipline action working group. I'm one of the co-chairs. We're organizing to work collaboratively with stakeholders to create some minimum, dis minimum discipline language, viable, effective alternatives to suspension and expulsion when appropriate, and policies that focus on what is best for all the students involved all of the stakeholders involved. Um, we need to teach our students to be lifelong learners, critical thinkers, problem solvers, and all those other buzzwords, and discipline is gonna play a huge role in that. Um, so we just need to work collaboratively, and it will take time, as Abby said, to do what is um, right for our students, it's best for our faculty, our county, and our society. So thank you, and let us do that work. Thank you both, thank you. and thank you for speaking on both at one time. <laughs> our next speaker is uh, Diana Bergman. Hello. How you Hello. doing? Good. Oh, it was a overwhelming news to see that three very important people will be leaving us. Dr. Dance, our student board member, and Ms. Williams. Um, I'm saddened. So regarding this policy, some of the things I agree with what TAPCO said. I think we could take it a step further as a parent besides just a public hearing. I'm thinking more along the lines of a focus group regarding discipline, because this is not just an issue with just our teachers, half of that comes from home, from us as parents, and we should have an opportunity to be involved and um, have a say-so as parents and stakeholders, as a community that supports our children that live in our community for education and make a, a difference, this is very important. So I'm gonna give you three scenarios. Um, one thing that I noticed about policy 5560, when you identify the parents, the superintendent, the teachers, you're not addressing the issue with our English learners. They should have somewhere on the policy written where disciplinary action and the procedure taking place for their disciplinary behavior should be given to them with the opportunity in their native language. Okay, that causes a lot of problems in BCPS when you have a language barrier and these children don't understand the handbook because it comes in one language even though you have internet access and it could be, um, and you know, put on there, but if they don't have the reading skills in their native language, um, even if you provide in their native language and reading and they can't read, guess what? They're not still not having the equal information and access to that information to understand the process. The other piece is the social media piece and the mobile devices and the handheld devices. And some teachers will sit there and say, well, it motivates them if they could earn a reward to have some time on it. Um, no, it motivates my child that has a 12 foot trampoline. I don't let him take that to school every day. So if you want handheld devices to motivate these kids to stay on task, then maybe you should provide them all equally that chance. It's a distraction. We can't monitor it. The teachers can't monitor it when it belongs to the parent or that child and I think it's a distraction in the classroom 
where they're supposed to be getting their education. And I'm running out of time. Do I have my other three minutes since I signed up on the other one to continue? <laughs> well, no, we'll call you on the next one. Okay, fine, I'll continue then. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Our next speaker is Kathleen Rabarzik. Good evening, everyone. Um, Dr. Jantz and the members of the board. Um, as you know from me speaking up here before, I wear many hats in relation to BCPS. I'm the parent of an alumnus and two students currently enrolled. Um, I'm a community member. I've lived in my neighborhood for almost my entire life. So um, I'm very familiar with my three local schools and the magnet school my youngest attends. However, I also work for Baltimore County Public Schools in the Office of Student Behavior with Dr. Woodley. Um, these are our babies, <laughs> policy 5550 and 5560 and the student handbook are ultimately what we work on hardest throughout the year. Um, as a parent, I've had one alumnus and two current BCBS students, as I said. Um, my two sons who attend Towson High and Cromwell Valley Elementary uh, get their handbooks every August. We sit down, we go through them, we sign off and we send it back. Um, my experience from work and from listening to my community members is that a lot of people don't take that kind of care. So when something happens and something blows up at a school, um, in a neighborhood or in a community, there's a problem because even though people, you know, sign off and send it back, they don't necessarily know what they've signed off on. And that's their responsibility. But as the previous lady said, there's also that responsibility to people who have trouble comprehending what they're reading. Um, we probably also, in the focus groups and the public forums that have been suggested, need to look at how we've worded things. Um, but beyond all these influence is the one that makes the biggest difference, I think, beyond complying with federal and state regulations, um, beyond complying with how we want our environments at school to be. And that's the um, collective viewpoint on how to deal with children and teens who step out of line and make mistakes. Um, these are children who may not have the best learning environment at home for how to behave in public, just because of circumstances, of you know, lack of parental supervision at home, a whole host of different possibilities. Um, and we have to decide whether we're going to ha exert the iron fist or the guiding hand. And that's very difficult, because when kids step out of line, it can stir up all kinds of trouble in communities, depending on the severity of what's happened. It can stir up things in the media. Heaven forbid, it can stir up things on social media, which is a whole nother thorny issue we have to get into with discipline, um, given the changes in the state's cyberbullying policies um, that were recently done. Um, I've learned a lot in working for Baltimore County about what's called restorative practices. And this is something that is filtered down from the criminal justice system and now is becoming part of the school system. And I hope we will continue to inform, educate, and improve on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. Okay, more than the next policy. Nope, we're still on 5550. 5550. Yes, 5550. Okay. Policy 5550. <coughs> I think you should consider renaming this policy to Student Ethics Code because it reflects the standards students will strive for preparing for college and careers. When you use the behavior code, sometimes it could. <laughs> If you think about it, it could give a negative connotation when you read through the related policies because it's used interchangeably with policy 5560, which outlines the negative consequences of viol violating the behavior code. And it kind of takes away from you focusing on the leadership development needs that the students have. I think as education leaders, we should be cognizant of how policy 5550 and 5560 can reflect the school to prison pipeline if our leaders aren't on the same page with how they decide on the outcomes of each student's uh, decision making. Let's be aware of the words that are being used and what we can replace them with. For example, it states in the policy statement B, all students are required to behave in a manner that does not 
disturb or otherwise interfere with the orderly conduct of the activity. Instead of all students are required to behave, you could say all students are encouraged to lead in a manner that positively influence others to cooperate and uh, contribute to the learning environment. I know that was kind of off, but you, you see how you can take a statement and uh, make it a, a lot more positive in terms of what we're striving here for our students. Sometimes we read policies such as this, and it can take the humanity or empathy away from a child uh, who may be facing a lot of challenges in life uh, that he or she has trouble expressing. Now, I'm not saying if a student makes a poor choice that there should not be uh, consequences, but we should rethink punishment of certain offenses and apply, just like the uh, um, speaker before me said, apply restorative practices in your policies. And use that language, use restorative uh, practices more than you hear discipline. Because discipline, uh, it, it, you're taking um, like a human being um, with potential versus a criminal. Um, so we have to just watch how we kind of word things uh, when we're talking about our, our children. Lastly, how many parents in here has experienced negative behavior with your children? Have you been disrespected by your own child? Have your child yelled at you? slammed doors, broken or vandalized your home, or hit a sibling out of anger. What did you do? And think about that when, when you are applying this policy. Our next, uh, our next uh, policy uh, for comment is 5560. Um, thank you, Ms. Baton and Ms. Sexton for speaking all at once on the last one. Uh, Diana Bergman. Okay, I'm back for my other three minutes. Um, <laughs> um, basically, um, we didn't have social media to worry about about 15 years ago. So it's, um, it's an area that we have to address now with no boundaries and create a new safe culture for that. So I'll give you an example. Um, if my middle school son that's gonna make mistakes because he's you know, going through his hormonal change and wants to be popular in school and text something inappropriate to his lady friend that he has an interest in and she texts something back that's inappropriate, that cell phone is under my husband's name, my husband that works in the NSA building with a top secret security clearance. And that's an underage child now that sent an inappropriate picture. Guess who could compromise everything he's worked hard for in his career? My husband, because is his cell phone, is under his name. So this is one of the other reasons why I think cell phone, hand, personal handheld devices shouldn't be allowed in school and there should be a disciplinary action to address that. Now, if the school district wants children to use handheld devices and use them in a safe, appropriate manner, then you guys should provide them. It's now your property and you can educate children how to properly use them. But the personal use of stuff, like something like so personal, like a small computer that we carry around us all the time, that should be kept out of that education environment, in my opinion. Another thing, too, when I'm looking at the discipline policies, I have this experience, too, with a younger child that's on the autism spectrum. He violates the handbook code of conduct and I don't feel like equitably because of his disability, um, his disciplinary action gets addressed the way it should. And if he has a proper intervention plan, then I think he could handle the consequences at the level that he understands because that does get taught at his level. So there's so many details when we're looking at this policy regarding our children from language barriers to make sure they comprehend, from an emotionally level to make sure they comprehend the seriousness and what not just the discipline is, but what a consequence is. A consequence could be taught to children and it doesn't always have to be negative or aggressive. There's positive consequences that could come out to teaching children and we should have a disciplinary policy that reflects that opportunity. And thank you for your time. I look forward to the public hearing. Thank you. Our next speaker is Marion Moore. I just like to exercise. I really should be sitting in here. 
<laughs> Policy 5560. The young lady before me, I really, really like your speech. I agree. On page one, section C of, this, of the policy statement, um, my suggestion is to include or integrate the term restorative practices in the process for suspension statement. On page four, the third standard letter A, The Student Behavior Code establishes standards for students' behavior and disciplinary consequences for violations of those standards. I think you should include restorative practice, practices. Restorative practice helps to prevent further problems with students because you are treating them as a person and not a criminal. The student or the student's parent uh, this is also, I'm not, I'm sh not sure if it's on page uh, four, but you, you mentioned that if a student um, gets into trouble or facing a consequence, that you should provide the parent and the student with the resources, uh, a resource list, a community resource list. Well, I wonder, do you, I mean, do you just hand it to them and, and, and just allow them to leave and figure it out for themselves? Or do you have something, some type of database system, intranet, that is available to parents and students to apply for these programs very seamlessly? I think that would be uh, extremely helpful. Now, uh, medication was mentioned as one of the offenses. Um, and my major concern is the amount of students who are being referred to medical programs as a result of their behavior that may uh, provide, where doctors would provide them with medication for misbehaving. I believe there should be other holistic health approaches to keep students from ph pharmaceutical drugs where they end up being addicted. I think that somehow the school system is tied into the epidemic that our students are faced with in terms of drugs because you provide that in, uh, with, in conjunction with the medical industry, you provide that to mainly African Americans, uh, students, uh, boys anyway. You give them medicine. So then they get hooked on drugs, right? Um. Most of them. So let's look at how, how everything is framed in the policy and how it impact our students who are being diagnosed and given medication uh, through your school system nationwide. Thank you. Thank you. Our last policy for public comment tonight is 6602. Uh, and the first speaker is Deanna Bergman and then Marion Moore. All righty, thank you very much. Ms. Moore. <clears throat> Is she coming back? I know your employees are upset with me right now. Okay, policy 6602. Although this uh, is a policy that is planned on being deleted, I would like to acknowledge how alternative education should not necessarily be the last resort for students due to poor decision making. making. Perhaps it should be the first resort for students so that they will receive the personalized educational experience that will help them pre uh, prevent them from making poor decisions. <laughs> I, I looked on the website at the alternative programs. Some of them were like online learning, personalized blended learning and stuff like that. Well, if that's given and provided in the school setting more consistently, then it probably would prevent students from getting suspended. So let's look at this full circle. There are several internal and external factors 
connected to the student behavior code, suspension, expulsion, and assignment to the alternative education program. There's a causal connection between the, turno the teacher turnover and teacher so shortages with students' behavior and the consequences for behaving. For example, if new teachers are having challenges with class management, it can lead to sus uh, suspension uh, due to the student's frustration with how lessons are implemented or lack of consistency. So why should a, a student pay the price for, student, uh, for teachers who are unguided or unorganized? Also, have administrators focus on how there's a ca causal connection with substitute teachers and the suspension rates? How can we integrate alternative education programs with the uh, substitute teachers through technology? Second, and I'll keep this one brief because I've talked about it all night, but um, there is a causal connection with race and a suspension uh, rate. And, and what are you going to do about it? Bullying is also a common connection or has a common connection and the lack of having a, le a leadership development program uh, for uh, the students who are bullying. And then let's think about the victims who are being bullied and they decide to respond to the bully and they get suspended. <coughs> that connection, how are we, you know, trying to figure out what is it that we can do as leaders uh, in terms of bullying? And lastly, parents. We have to do a better job, of course, in terms of um, how we model you know, respect for one, one another and, and our children. And um, we, we owe them. Um, they didn't ask to be here. We brought them here, right? So we definitely need to be more involved. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Uh, item Q on our agenda is board committee updates, and I'll begin with Mr. Yulefelder and the Audit Committee. Um, the Audit Committee uh, met last month and, as usual, reviewed all the uh, various audits that the uh, internal audit is involved in, and um, it was a very informative meeting. Um, there's really nothing more to report other than it was a very informative meeting. Very good. Thank you. Uh, next, the Building and Contracts Committee, Mr. McDaniels. Uh, we have met this evening. We have our next meeting scheduled for our next board meeting. I think it's May 8th, I think. And uh, we'll just proceed with reviewing the contract as they're presented. Thank you. Uh, next, the Curriculum Committee, Mrs. Johnson. Thank you. We have not met since March 16th. Our next meeting is May 18th. Um, but at the last meeting, we did discuss the AVID five-year contract extension. So thank you to my fellow board members for extending that contract for AVID. As you can see, the, the positive effect that it has had um, on our students and our teachers in the, in the county. Thank you. Very good. Uh, next, digital safety, Mrs. Miller. Thank you. We continue to ask for a process for determining student device time. Um, Ms. Hen, who also serves on the committee, made the suggestion that software exists, which may be useful, and I'm hoping to get further information on that. Our next meeting is next week, April 25th. Thank you very much. Um, the PRC committee, uh, Mr. Virch, do you have a report or? I think you've heard it all tonight. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, that uh, I think hits all the committees. And if it does, unless I hear that I've missed one, uh, it's time for board member comments. And I'll ask Mr. Stewart to begin those. Always um, good evening. So first of all, I just want to uh, thank uh, or really congratulate Ms. Baton for winning and uh, for being able to serve again in this capacity. I think it's a really uh, critically important one and this board I know appreciates the relationship that we've been able to build with her. Um, Ms. Brad, thank you for your service. I think it's uh, been tremendously diligent and um, open-minded and I think it, you've been a real value add to this board so thank you for that. Um, to Ms. Johnson, who I know had to leave, I think that she's a good example. Williams. Oh, Ms. Williams. <laughs> Many of us, for some reason, make that mistake. Um, she has shown us kind of how, how it's done, right? She has a big lift with uh, PRC, and those are going to be big shoes to fill, no doubt. But um, uh, it's been a, a tremendous honor to work with her. But finally, Dr. Dance, I know there's uh, lots to be said about the last few years. I want to thank you for the focus on equity, for raising um, our performance as a system. I want to thank you for the massive capital program that you've helped this county 
shape and be able to roll out, which is a huge um, attribute for, for us. Thank you for bringing a lumbering system into the 21st century as far as technology is concerned, but thank you for raising expectations and objectives for, for all of us, for our students, our very large team that we have here. You know, there is, again, much to be said, but one of the things that's good to point out is this is a leader who built for himself and for the system a team um, of superstars. And uh, I'm grateful that we've had their years of service and I'm grateful that many will continue to serve us, but I think it's a reflection on the kind of person that uh, he is. Um, and there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes um, that no one will ever quite know or appreciate, um, but we thank you for it from top to bottom. Mrs. Eaton. Thank you. I, I too would like to thank Dr. Dance for his dedication to Baltimore County Public Schools. I wish him good luck and happiness in his future endeavors. The school system is truly losing a great superintendent. Even though Ms. Williams left, she still told me to say my comments. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I would also like to thank Romaine Williams for five years of service to Baltimore County Public Schools. Romaine, I was honored to have you as a seatmate. I will miss you. Thank you, Ms. Eaton. Mr. Yulefelder. Um, I just, I'll, I'll have some comments uh, relative to Dallas uh, before he departs. <laughs> I have no other comments. Very good. Mrs. Johnson. Um, again, I want to thank Ms. Williams for her service here for the last five years and Aislinn for your time here. And only another oh, SMOB will know how hard you worked. So. It's a, you know, it's a small sorority fraternity that, you, that yeah. you're in. And welcome Josie for, from Pikesville High School. She will be our seatmate uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, so, Dr. Dance, this is for you and for your cabinet and your staff and your, all the people that, all the text messages I got today from teachers who said they were just paralyzed and they couldn't work. They, they couldn't even believe that, uh, that the news that they got. And of course I said go back to work. But um, dope shot, drum shot, mug shot, gun shot, or jump shot. For many young black boys in this country, in our county, and believe it or not, in this community, that was their only shot. There are few role models in, our li in their life on TV or in the radio that young men can look up to. Under the leadership of Dr. S. Dallas Dance, they can look around the room and see men like Kevin Smith, Michael Dickerson, Dr. John Mayo, Chuck McDaniels, Pete Dixit, Craig Crawley, Victor Lewis, Dr. Craig Cuellar, and George Roberts, and of course, Dr. Dance himself. And they are able to see that they have another shot. With clean choices and the right education and a genuine character, they too can be a teacher, a principal, a member of the cabinet, an IT director, a videographer, um, or even the superintendent of the 25th largest school district in this country. For three and a half years, I've had the pleasure to work with Dr. Dance and his team as a partner in advancing educa education and equity in all of our schools and in delivering <coughs> our children with a 21st century learning environment. At every turn, I have been grateful for his leadership as our superintendent and for his friendship. A good leader is bold and tough and fearless, but is able to keep their heart in the right place because at the end of the day, we are all human. At the end of the day, a good father knows he only has one shot to get it right for his son, one shot to leave a legacy that his family will be proud of. A good superintendent knows when he has advanced the system to places that we never ever dreamed possible. A good superintendent knows when he has built a team that can keep the momentum and the progress advancing despite its ad adversaries. A good superintendent knows when his presence is a distraction from the real work. And in order to deliver a culture of deliberate excellence for every student, every school, and every community, he knows when it's time to step aside, not down, but aside. A predator's instinct is des designed to detect, detect motion leaving innovators particularly vulnerable to attack at risk of being consumed by those wanting to feed, to satiate an immediate need or an illogical impulse. Leadership that maintains status quo is rarely moved upon by the hungry masses. Leadership who advances a community is always finds prey to those illogical predators. We are a board of education, 
We are a board of education, not a board of how often the superintendent travels, not, uh, not a board on the length of his hair, not a board of transportation or lunches or recess or HVAC units. We are not a board of assumptions and accusations. We are a board of education, so let's get back to that. As we begin searching for a new school superintendent, I am guided by Dr. Dance's bold and principled le leadership. He was never afraid to make the right choice for our kids, even in the face of certain criticism, because the right path is rarely the easy one. He also worked to develop potential he saw in others, including me, so for that years to come, our school will benefit from the same qualities that make him an effective leader. While Dr. Dance will be missed dearly, I am confident that his legacy at BCPS will be everlasting. Thank you. Do you have comments? I think I said all I needed. Very good. Mr. Birch. Speeches and praise uh, fall into two categories. One is when we're congratulating someone, and the other is when they've passed. Um, I haven't decided yet with you, Dr. Dance. Uh, <laughs> Dallas and I, we've disagreed, and they've been strong disagreements, and we've agreed, and they've been strong agreements. And I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll work on what I, what I, um, um, what I assess. Uh, my initial thoughts are, You've shown us you can beat the odds. The deck, the deck is not permanently stacked against us. And for that, I salute you. A um, couple of things about our system. Uh, during the break, I was able to go over to our Carver High School, take a walk around, see uh, Roxanne and Joanne uh, who work there when all everybody else is away from the school because it's spring break. But they're there getting that school ready for when the students, our students return. I also uh, met the Recreation and Parks person, Ann. There's all these Anns at Carver. I'm not sure why that is. Uh, but uh, she talked to me about that baseball diamond that, that we're still waiting for the grass, for its roots to find their way into the ground so that we can get our, our ball players out there and, and, uh, and compete. But it won't be ready for this uh, school year. But it'll be coming. And that's the promise of education and what it can bring us. Um, um, Brother Gillis alluded to uh, the Film Expo, uh, for centuries, people just like us have sat around the flickering light and told stories. And at the Film Expo at the Senator, uh, we were able, Ed and I, and lots of others to see fantastic films from our students. Uh, and really, hats off to Vinny Sacchetti for best in show from our Carver with his uh, short film, For Sale. Um, I won't go into details. But he said, the film is a metaphor. <laughs> Artists, you got to love them. Um, this is Autism Awareness uh, Month. And um, at our Golden Ring Middle School, um, Art for a Cause will be putting on an event. You're certainly welcome to attend. It starts at 5. And as I say, it's to uh, benefit uh, Autism Awareness Month. And Thursday is another meeting of the Victory Villa Boundary Study folks. Uh, the committee members have been working very hard, and the committee's been participating. And with that, I'll pass off to uh, my, my seatmate, Chuck. Thank you very much. I'm going to be brief. I just wanted to reflect for a moment on the conference that Mr. Gillis referenced uh, earlier in uh, the National School Board uh, conference that we attended. There were several workshops there that uh, were associated with getting parents and the community more involved in the education process. And I just thought at that time that we're very fortunate in Baltimore County to have some very passionate involved parents and communities. <clears throat> I also thought about Ms. Williams and her passion for those that are disadvantaged and disconnected from being involved in the educational system. We have homeless children. We have children whose parents are not able to attend these meetings, that don't have computers to communicate. And those are the children that she was most passionate about. And that's what I think I'll remember mostly about her service and time on the board, how she gave a voice to those that didn't have a voice um, as a part of the process. So as she leaves, I will try to pick up that thought and keep those kind of kids in the forefront of my mind. Also, uh, another uh, workshop that I attended was in terms of uh, technology integration. And uh, also, I attended some workshops on equity and access. 
And at those times, it made me really reflect on how far we had come as Baltimore County in terms of technology integration. The things that were being discussed were things we actually talked about three and four years ago. So it made me realize, again, before the announcement today, how far Dr. Dance has really brought us with his innovation and forward thinking in terms of, the, um, again, both just not just in technology, but in equity and access for all of our children. So I have a tremendous amount of respect for Dr. Dance. I really appreciate the things that you've brought to Baltimore County, and I think time will tell how important that work will be for our kids. So I wanted to thank you again. And I, like Mr. Yulfelder, probably have more stuff to say, but I did want to thank you on today for all your time and investment for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Miller. I wanted to thank Romaine Williams for her service. She truly has a very big heart, and she's already being missed. Uh, on the discipline policies, I appreciate all the comments on the policies and, and the many more that are yet to come. Uh, everyone agrees that this issue is very serious and urgently needs to be addressed. We heard several people speak about the impact on students who have violated the student behavior code, but few spoke on students who are not violating the code. These are the great majority of our student population, and I hope we can bring all interests and needs into consideration as we move forward in addressing this issue. There are different ways to inadvertently or not undermine efforts. One is to delay action, even if it's done under the auspices of being thorough. So let's keep that in mind as we hold public input hearings, committees, work groups, and focus groups. At some point, we just need to roll up our sleeves and dive in. That time is now, and I ask that the board move forward with urgency in holding a public hearing and adopting effective discipline policies. Mrs. Hen. Thank you. So I was absolutely thrilled last week to hear about funding for the new middle school in the Perry Hall area, as well as the addition to Pine Grove Middle. I want to thank County Executive Cabinet, Superintendent Dance, Councilwoman Kathy Bevins, Councilman David Marks, and everyone else for their hard work to make this, these plans become a reality. For 30 years, two generations of students have suffered due to the overcrowding at Perry Hall Middle. And to see that we are moving forward with a solution to them means more than I can express. To tell my daughter that her school there's relief coming for the classmates that will follow her in her school. Again, means more than I can express. So thank you, Dr. Dance. Um, I will have comments regarding your leave at a later date when the shock wears off, um, but you will be severely missed. Um, so with that, thank you. Very good. good uh, there are uh, several items of information at uh, tab S on your agenda. Importantly, uh, the revised school calendar for the remainder of this year as well as for next year. Our next board meeting is May 9 at 6.30 p.m. We're adjourned.